Okay, you should be... Should be D-Day, Battlefield, and Normandy. I'm going to give everyone a second to get on there. Let's make sure it's going. Can you have me looking down a couple times? I'm just going to give everyone a couple seconds. And let's just make sure. I'll send the link one more time just to make sure everyone's on it. Duplicate the sound too much. Annoying little feature of this. Okay, so I put down you can chat and uh, it looks like people are on here now. I gave everyone a couple seconds. And so if you chat on here, I can see the chat and this will also record live on my video. I see a little dark here. Let in a little more light. Okay, so can everyone see me? And yeah, I have, a, I have the screen open. I have about three screens on right now with one with the PowerPoint, one with my encoder, and one with YouTube so I can see if anyone chats. This is quite the operation. And so it looks like everyone's on. So we're going to talk a little bit about D-Day. And I hope you like that Battlefield Europe. I think it's a good video. I like how it covers the events that led up to the battle and also the, uh, the equipment, the tactics. Um, gotta love the guy's voice. It's one of the better ones I've seen on that. There are better, uh, some parts are better videos, and the World at War is fantastic, the, the Great Service of 1973. But I just like that one because it covers a lot of the details. It gets a little bit of Italy, of Kurtz, and a number of other things. And so that part I'm not going to cover, except for just very briefly. But can you see the screen? That's actually Utah Beach right there. There are very few pictures from Utah Beach, Utah Beach or any of the invasion beaches. They accidentally threw out almost all the film and both motion picture and photography film. After the battle, a few days after, they put them all in a bunch of satchel sacks, all these battles. Imagine these big duffel bags full of film, full of, of re, um, undeveloped reels of film, so mostly 16 millimeter film. And a number of photographers were killed or wounded in this fight. So that even makes it more tragic that they gave up for this film to record this day. And they put it on one of these Higgins boats. Those are the landing craft right there. And they brought them out to, or they're going to carry them out to, uh, back to the ships and then back to England for, to be developed. And somebody accidentally threw them all out. So we only have a few films, a few photographs, just a few motion picture uh, scenes from the actual June 6th invasion, which is a tragedy. That, you can see, is why Omaha Beach, uh, the code name for the Middle Beach, was so difficult. You see the cliffs behind? It, that gave perfect fields of fire for the Germans. It was hell on earth. You can see some of the beach defenses. And there's one more thing. You go to Omaha Beach today. It's nice sand beach. You go there now, and or now it's all sand. Then it was rocks. It was pebbles like a river rock and a really hard beach. And But then the years or the about six months after it, and they were still using the beaches to unload supplies because they didn't have a harbor and the other harbors were destroyed in a storm. They, uh, U.S. Army engineers bulldozed all the rocks away. So now it's a nice sandy beach, but it's a cold beach. So let's go to a couple things. That's uh, World War II, the basic situation, the beginning of the year 1942. And uh, the U.S. had entered the war in 41. Remember, Germany declared war on the United States four days after D-Day. 
and now the U.S. is involved in Europe. And this area in gray right here, that's the extent of the German invasion in 1943. This spot where my mouse is, that's Stalingrad. And the Germans are about ready to surrender right there. And they would retreat to, if you look where my mouse is, the line would be right about here. And the Battle of Kurtz would be right where that says July right there. So the map's not a great one, but at least gives you an idea. And the important thing to understand about that is by 1942, during 1942, it was unclear if Germany would be stopped in the Soviet Union. Yes, the, the Germans didn't take Moscow in 41, but who knows how far they could go. Now, by 43, it was not only clear that German advances had stopped, but after the Battle of Kurtz, which is in the movie Battlefield, the German army was destroyed. And... That would become more apparent by the end of the year. I'll get to that when I get to Tehran. Oops, sorry. Let's go back here. But here's the important thing. This area here was controlled by Vichy France, which was the collaborative government um, that was created in southern France to administer the colonies and they collaborated with the Germans. And so that's Tunisia. Libya was a, an Italian colony that was fighting across the North Africa. But the United States effort since the very beginning, the U.S. goal was to attack cross channel and take the war to Germany. And they wanted to do it in 1942. Now, it was clear to everybody involved, including the United States, that the U.S. was not ready. The U.S. did not have an army. They didn't have, uh, in fact, landing craft. They didn't have near enough. And the British were awkward and hard to make. But they had to cross or that was the original plan. I'm just checking to see if there's any messages. The original plan was to attack right here across France and defeat them in Germany. Now, one thing about Churchill, his experience from World War I taught them they did not want to fight a major land war in France again. He was at the Somme. He was at near uh, Passchendaele and Ypres. He was in the British Army for six months after he got fired as first Lord of the Aberty, then they brought him back. But he wanted to attack in what he called the soft underbelly, North Africa and Italy. That's where he wanted to attack, where my mouse is going around right there, thinking that that would be easier. Now, that's just crazy. If you've ever been to Italy, it's all mountains on the spine of Italy. And in the Balkans, with the Germans control, that is mountainous, rugged territory. It, and then in France, attacking southern France, there's mountains all across here. It really was a farcical idea. Churchill had certain great gifts, but he did not understand tactics. In fact, anytime he got involved in the tactical side, he was normally wrong. He had this political gift and, and could give in great focused arguments. But by 42, it's clear they weren't ready to attack here. And so Churchill got them to attack in North Africa first and then Sicily and Italy, which turned into a quagmire. Now, that they cover pretty well in the movie Battlefield. But in 1942, at a little place right here called Dieppe, in fact, let me get my map right here. Dieppe is right here where my mouse is circling on that map. I know it's a little bit thin, but there's where the map is. In 1942, they used Canadian soldiers who had just arrived to do a raid. More than anything else, to probe the Atlantic wall defenses, what defenses would Hitler was, was calling the defenses of France, even though it was not really near a real wall. But this was a harbor town. They knew that the Germans would probably defend that pretty strongly. And it was just going to be a raid. Attack, gather information, pull out. Well, they attacked in three beaches at Dieppe that was not all that well defended, but since it was a, har since it was a harbor, there were shore guns, and the Germans did have some, some protection. And we don't need to go into details of the raid but it was a disaster. Most of the Canadian forces met heavy resistance. They never got off the beach. Casualties were high and they had to pull back. Here are, those are Canadian dead. Um, that's a, a Canadian landing craft, a few Canadian, well, British made Churchill, but they're used by the Canadian tanks. And those are German soldiers looking at the dead right there. And the realization hit that the invasion is gonna be much more difficult, but also, gave ammunition to Churchill saying they should go to the soft underbelly, Italy, which turned out to be a quagmire, 
But in 42, after this, the agreement was made, hey, let's attack North Africa and Italy. Going into 43, the decision was still to attack in Sicily. Now that's Battlefield. We're not going to watch that right now. We're going right on to Tehran. Well, in 1943, after North Africa had been taken by the Allies and the Allies had decided to attack Sicily, the big three for the first time met Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill in Tehran, Iran. And they met there. Um, they met there for the first time to discuss future plans. But this was after the Battle of Kursk. The German army's back was broken by the Soviets at the Battle of Kursk. They were in full retreat. Full retreat. And so even though Roosevelt had basically agreed with Churchill will attack Italy, when they got to Tehran, Stalin arrived as a conquering hero. He had broken the back of the German army for two years since the United States entered the war, well, since the Soviets entered the war, when Germany attacked, Stalin had been begging, pleading, yelling, you name it, at Churchill and then Roosevelt to open up a second front, to attack in France, to pull German soldiers away from the Soviet Union. And so the second front, and he would be bitter about this for the rest of his life. Well, the Western Allies couldn't really do it, but Stalin didn't care. Millions of Soviets have died, and the Germans have gotten to the gates of Moscow. But after Kursk, at Tehran, Stalin is like, hey, you know, you don't really need to hurry. I understand the logistical problems. And once he said that, that's when Churchill and Roosevelt realized, oh, we've got to attack now. We've got to attack in France. Even Churchill, we got to attack because Stalin might win the whole thing. He might take all of Europe. The realization, realization is that we've got to open up a second front, which is what the Americans wanted anyways. So that's why Tehran was such a big deal. So there, the meeting was decided that the overall that basically what it was is that the Allies agreed to open up a second front. They talked about opening up the war of Japan. But this was a wartime conference. Nothing about after the war was really discussed. George Marshall, whose Time Magazine photo was right there, he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military. So he's the highest ranking U.S. military official. Roosevelt greatly admired him. He was a fantastic organizer. He did a great job getting the U.S. military ready for war, and Roosevelt wanted to make him the commander. The problem was there was no position in Europe that was high enough for his rank. The British would not accept him as commanding everything. The U.S. would only accept him as commanding all of the European theater, so they never chose Marshall. So Marshall would be the architect of victory. It, with my mouse, I'm pointing at him. That's him right there. And that's at the Atlantic Conference on the battleship Prince of Wales in, at Newfoundland. Not long after that, Prince of Wales would be heavily damaged by the battleship Bismarck and then be sunk by the Japanese a few days after Pearl Harbor off of the coast of Malaya. Little story. So the command actually went to, it's kind of a weird command structure they had. General Dwight Eisenhower, a U.S. general who commanded the U.S. forces in North Africa and then would command the invasion of Sicily, was given the overall commander of the invasion of, of France. Not of all forces in Europe. And eventually he would be the commander of all Allied forces in Europe, but not yet. It was decided to give him to an American, given to American general, even though the British had been in the war longer, the Americans are contributing more men and more equipment by 1944. And both sides knew by, by the end of 44, the bulk of men would be American and American supply. But General Montgomery, his time photograph was right there. He was given overall command of all, or overall command of the actual invasion itself. He planned the invasion. It would be his headquarters. 
that would command um, the two Ameri the, the two armies, the American army and the British army there, which included Canadians. And it was his plan. So he would be the commanding the invasion. So we've got the overall command, Montgomery, and there would be an overall command of the air and overall command of the sea, which would both be British. That's kind of a compromise. We'll give you command of that if we let Eisenhower, the American, be overall command. The leading American commander was General Omar Bradley. And Bradley was a very sound general, nothing dynamic. He had been a um, chief of staff and then a corps commander under George Patton in Sicily. But Patton had two different times slapped and belittled soldiers suffering from shell shock, and he was removed from command. Almost certainly Patton would have been given command, and he was the general the Germans feared the most, not because he was the most brilliant, but because he was the most aggressive. And all the American, all the Allied commanders, Montgomery, Bradley, and Eisenhower, were exceedingly cautious. And so the, the Germans did not fear them as much, unlike the Soviet and, and German commanders, which were much more aggressive. So those are the three commanders. And one thing we just have to mention, this could not happen, the invasion, until the U-boat threat, the U-boat uh, threat. <laughs> okay, uh, the U-boat threat, that's a German U-boat right under the Battle of Atlantic. The U-boat threat to Allied supplies from America, um, that threat was ended in, uh, by 1943. The Americans and the British had won a victory in the Battle of the Atlantic. That creepy Time magazine cover, <laughs> which I think is one of the greats, that is, Admiral Donitz, who is the commander of the German U-boats, and having him as a periscope. Hey, I like it. But by middle of 43, it was clear that the Germans, uh, the German U-boat threat has ended, and so supplies could come pouring in from the United States by end of 43 into 44. And uh, that's the map of the Battle of Atlantic, that area that my mouse is going over is where the, the peak of the submarine attacks were. But a combination of air power, radar, sonar, and the German U-boat threat was pretty much neutralized, even though still a threat. So there's a situation by 1944, and that's June 6th. And you can see that the Germans had pushed the, uh, or the Soviets had pushed the Germans back out of most of the Soviet Union. In fact, the Soviets, their plan, they said that's a terrain where my mouse is, they would do the biggest military operation in the history of mankind called Operation of Bagration, right here at the same time as D-Day. So the plan was to attack on both sides at the same time. You also notice that Sicily and the, north, the southern part of the Italian boot had been taken. In fact, Rome would fall two days before D-Day on June 6th. But this had turned into a quagmire and a bloody sideshow to the war. And so, there is a map of France. And by 43, when it was clear that the Allies were going to attack, this is the map they looked at with the basic German positions. As you can see from there, it has these marks. These boxes right here are shore defenses. The box with the X where my mouse is circling, circling are the... That's a infantry division that's more mobile. Shore defenses are stuck to their fortifications. And the Germans try to defend the whole beach, but they knew where my mouse is, right about here, the extent of Allied fighter covers where they're going to attack. And so what they did is they looked at flat stretches of beaches and defended. And they did it logically. Calais, right here, flat beach. That would be the most obvious place of an attack. And so they defended that the heaviest. They put shore defenses. In fact, if you go there today, it's pretty remarkable. They saw these massive defenses. It's, you can go visit some. Um, some are tourist traps. Some are turned into restaurants or things like that. But it's an incredibly elaborate defense. Dieppe was right here. And so that's what they expected. That's where they had their best units. But then other spots, all the way to Brest down here, they defended. And so a couple flat beaches and areas here. Uh, along Dieppe, and then the Carantine Coast in Normandy, right here. Now, they knew that was a possibility, but they looked at it and thought they might attack here, but Calais is only 20 miles, and so it's a relatively short crossing. They were thinking that the invasion fleet would be vulnerable, and slow-moving landing craft on the ocean would be very vulnerable. 
But the big thing is this. If they attack here and take Calais, it's a much closer distance to Germany, a much quicker jaunt to Germany. And so they just assumed this is the obvious place to attack. But at Normandy with this long beach, they did defend and they put more than anything else, harbor cities and they really defended like Cherbourg, St. Malo and Brest and a few other beach areas. But they expected here, maybe here, but especially here, really only three areas. And so the allies by summer of 19, or by the fall of 43 realized, especially after seeing what happened at Dieppe, we can't attack at Calais. It'll be a slaughter. We don't have enough landing craft. If the invasion fails, it would be months, it, or maybe never would they be able to attack again. And so they rolled the die, even though it's 100 miles further, 100 miles further away, the decision was to attack here. And the Americans were based in this part of Britain, so they would get the western beaches, and the British and Canadians were here, so they get the eastern beaches. That was the way they did it. They knew it's further away from Germany, but that was the plan. But they knew also that this would be incredibly hard too. They have to convince the Germans that Calais was the real threat. And so they began Operation Fortitude. Fortitude was, it's actually a pretty amazing thing. They set up a fake army with all kinds of fake equipment. Now, these are the most famous ones. These are ones that they made inflatable tanks. Those are inflatable Sherman. The other one's an inflatable uh, Churchill, which is a British tank. And they made these, but most of them were made out of paper mache or almost like a, a mock-up painted with a piece of board, painted to look like a tank. And they would move these all over, but they put them in more northern England. And so yeah, I moved up here, up here, with the idea being, or not really northern, but more eastern England. So up here, they made this whole fake army and they put these tanks all over and other equipment and they use that and they use fake planes and fake boats. So here is a fake, it's a, called a Boston bomber, but they made it from wood and tarp and painted to look like a bomber. Here's another one. These are much more simpler. Make a plane, make the wings, put this insignia on it, insignia on it. Here's a fake landing craft they put down. But the big key to this is they laid miles of camouflage tarp. Camouflage netting. So this is a German planner in camouflage netting, but I just want to give you an idea of what it looked like. This was a developed in World War I. They put this camouflage netting on top with um, hung on poles about 10 feet above the ground. And they would cover massive fields with camouflage tarping. So it's difficult to see what was underneath, so you could hide what was underneath. And the thing about it is that from the air, and that picture you see on the corner, that is camouflage tarping in southern England. If you look at that, you know there's something underneath, but you don't know what. So German reconnaissance planes would fly, would buzz over early in the morning or late at night, get quick pictures of this area. And they went over, they saw camouflage netting, and they didn't know what was underneath, but the assumption was they must be hiding something. And so they covered miles with this camouflage netting with nothing underneath. And then on the edge, they'd put one or two of those fake tanks or fake planes or fake landing craft with the idea is they could see one tank and the implication being that all must be covered or all must be covering real tanks ready for the invasion. And it worked perfectly. It was brilliant. And then they created a fake army called the First Army Group and they gave it to General Patton. Now Patton, remember what I told you, was kicked out of Sicily. Patton basically had to rehabilitate him rehabilitated, really, I can't even talk, rehabilitate himself. And the whole idea about that was he would go around England, Eastern England, and act like the commander. He would meet with people, set up his fake command. He would go around with his dog, a bull terrier named Willie. That's Willie. And the Germans would pick up that patent. Remember, they feared him the most, so they just assumed it. By the way, Patton would successfully rehabilitate himself and would be given command of an army, the third army, about a month and a half after D-Day. And then Fortitude sent up fake radio signals. And because they know they had radio detection devices like these to pick up all kinds of radio messages from, the, from England. 
And so sometimes an open message, sometimes with relatively mediocre code, knowing the German would break it, Germans would break it, they set out thousands of fake radio messages. Most of them were fake messages between like little units, like saying, you move up here, uh, move your headquarters here, uh, about practicing, all fake, and the Germans completely bought it. But one of the great things they did too, is they had an agent named Garbo, Juan Garcia, Garbo, was co that was his code name, the German Special Service, the SIS, which they still use today, does all their commando operations. German, the British were great at this kind of stuff. And Garcia was in Spain, and he was collecting information from the, from the British ambas embassy in Spain. Now, Spain was neutral, but their government was fascist under Francisco Franco, and so friendly with Germany. And so he passed on information that he claimed he was getting through Spain, to Spain, to Germany, that the invasion was going to happen at Calais. The invasions happened at Calais. Here it comes at Calais. And they totally bought this. Now, they very, the British cultivated this source for years. In fact, they gave Garbo real information, some, you know, not that important, but real information with the idea of being down the road, he will be able to Oh, I just got to see something. Sorry, I thought I had a message and I had to check. So they sent him real information that turned to be true. A lot of times they sent him information like, and he would pass it on like minutes after the operation started. So it was too late for them to use, but they could say, ooh, Garbo is a good source. He convinced them. <laughs> Garbo might have been the most effective part combined with fortitude. And then one more thing we have to get to, the French resistance called the Marquis. So if you had the French, sometimes you see them called the underground. French fighters fighting and risking their lives to um, do more than anything else, guerrilla attacks. But the big thing was that they gathered intelligence on the Germans and sent that to the, to the Allies, to the British and the Americans. But also they rescued Allied pilots who had been shot down by the Germans. They rescued thousands of them and spirited them either to the coast where they could be picked up by a submarine or a small boat or sometimes to, to Spain or, or Switzerland, which were neutral, and they could escape that way. And there is a... That's actually be a British poster about um, French resistance, and that's actually that's actually convinced the British to more in the fight. It's kind of a funny poster, but there's a couple different pictures of the resistance, and the thing is, they were risking their life, and this picture shows it right here. That's the execution of a of a suspected member of the resistance, and the retributions the Germans would do for resistance fighters. For every one German soldier killed by the French Marquis, the norm was to kill 10 and then 100 French civilians. And they would hold hostages that would be murdered immediately if there's any kind of attack by the French resistance. And they destroyed entire French towns. They did even more extreme in, in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and of course the Soviet Union. But the big thing they had the Marquis do, I don't thought I had a map here, but I don't have a map right there, but they went and they did a bunch of small attacks and gathered information a little bit behind Normandy, but the big one was at Calais. And so if the French resistance is attacking at Calais, that implies that the attack's gonna happen there and it worked brilliantly. And one more thing we have to get to. The decision was made, we need an active French force. And so, French forces that did not surrender to Germany, most of them either escaped to England when France fell in 1940 or remained in the colonies and some of the, some of the uh, African colonies like Senegal and the Cameroons and a few others, they stayed, they did not join the Vichy France and collaborate with the Germans. Well, this free, these French forces would soon be known as the Free French and a very controversial figure would take command, the what, six foot, Eight, General Charles de Gaulle would come in and de Gaulle um, was desperate to try to get some kind of position 
in the invasion. There would be a couple hundred French commandos actually participate in the invasion. But the big thing is they needed some kind of French force to show France when they invaded that there was a resistance to France and therefore caught, um, create the nucleus of a new France. And so the free French, de Gaulle graded on Churchill, him and Churchill did, didn't get along. De Gaulle was a uh, was kind of a hard man to get along with because he was desperate to try to get France's position back in the war. That's the French symbol right there, the free French symbol. There's a huge monument there at Normandy, but only a couple hundred participated. The great movie, The Longest Day, which I would like you to watch, and we'll figure out some way to do it. Um, I have some ideas. Somebody might have found a copy for free. We'll come back to that later. But it has a whole big session of the French commandos attacking at Wiesterham, which is um, part of the Eastern invasion beaches. But they really have a lot of French in The Longest Day. But that was a Cold War measure because you know, the French were a key element in the anti-Soviet NATO. That's another story. Okay, so here's a little bit of Fortress Europe, and that's one of the big 16-inch guns at Calais. Now, that's a propaganda poster, but he called it Festung Europa or, Forest, or Fortress Europe. And this was, much, more than anything else, kind of a propaganda ploy by Hitler. And they would send out maps like this, this is a very generic one, of all the coasts being defended. And this was almost always propaganda. No way they could defend everything. There are a few pillboxes Actually, for the first couple of years, they they spent a lot of money defending places like Bordeaux and Nats and places like that, when reality, it was just here where there was a chance to attack. The Netherlands, almost impossible because it, it could be so easily flooded and therefore an impossible place to invade. And there, and so it's right here at the, the tiny tip of Brussels all the way to Barbarets, as I showed you before. But it'd be in 43 that they'd really begin to defend it. And these were the areas right here where they first really put the strongest defenses. But eventually Normandy, when they realized a real invasion might happen. So here are a couple of the, these are the couple of the pillboxes. These are at, let's see, the northern one, that was, that's, that's Utah. And no, no, that's, that, yeah, that's Utah and that's Omaha Beach. These are some of the pillboxes and defenses. So these are, um, Normally they would add an 88 millimeter gun, which was a very effective uh, rifle gun that the Germans had. But this is, I think, a 76. They just stuck in there. So the guns are still there. You can go in here. Here is an observation spot for one of the pillboxes. You can see where you can look under here, but have your look under, but have your head protected, and oversee the entire coastline. It's a pretty amazing area. These are still there. You know, they're, you can see the shell holes where the enemy or US and British artillery hit it. And that's another picture of, that's, a, that's an ADA. And that's at a place just a little bit north of Utah or Omaha, with the idea that there's, well, there's some cliffs between, between the American beaches and the US beaches, and they were put in between so they could shell both sides. But you could see what a very effective um, defense that would be. On top, I mean, that's about 12 feet or about eight feet of cement. It is incredibly thick. And, you know, the gunners would be a little bit vulnerable. They're defended from most directions, and that could get on both sides of the beach and also hit and also lob shells, and it overlooks both sides of the beach on these high cliffs. There's another one at the same. There's, there's six big guns at that spot. So here's the commander of all German forces in Europe, and that or in Western Europe. That's Gerd von Rundstedt. Yes, his name is Gerd. And here he is talking to Hitler. He actually was in retirement. He was a field marshal. Field marshal in the United States, that's the equivalent of a, well, five-star general. And he would be tried for war crimes um, and at Nuremberg after the war. And there's a picture of von Rundstedt <laughs> during the invasion of the Soviet Union. I like that picture. But they had a weird dual defense. Von Rundstedt really didn't like or trust Adolf Hitler. He had different ideas. And the commander of the beach was given to Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who Church or Hitler had, had greatly admired, given him command in North Africa, and in fact pulled him out of Tunisia 
before the German forces surrendered there, Mornino had the reason to save his life and then gave him command here. He was known for armored warfare, and then, but then given command of the beach defenses. And him and von Rundstedt were not necessarily friends. They didn't work together, had different ideas about how to defend the beaches. Von Rundstedt didn't, thought it was folly to try to defend all the beach. And so he thought they could land. No. He thought they could move um, forces quickly to attack any beachhead that the Allies would take. Rommel thought that won't work. Because of the superiority of American air power, they're going to have to defend all the beaches. And to defend all the beaches, that means they're going to have to stop them on the beach. And his big argument was reinforcements would be so hampered by all the Allied air power that it would take forever for them to get there. So he wanted to defend the beaches and then have German armored units, tank divisions called Panzer divisions, right behind the beach to quick move and get to the beach. So there's Rommel looking at his beach defenses. He was... He was a Nazi and very much an ally of Hitler. But after this battle, he'd be wounded, then relieved, and he would become part of the plot just less than a, a little bit more than a month after D-Day to, to assassinate Hitler. And he would be given the option to take his own life, which he did, because he was such a hero. They didn't want to admit that this great hero of the Reich was involved with a plot to assassinate Hitler. But... He decided to lay miles of defenses. And the thing was, sure, at Calais, they could pour millions of gallons of reinforced steel fortifications, but they didn't have enough men. They used slave laborers and prisoners from the Russian front who they would work 12, 15 hours a day to build these defenses. But he decided to use the tides were really pretty extreme on the French coast, especially in Normandy. So let's put these beach defenses out. And you notice them laying these beach defenses here with the idea being that any landing craft, if they landed at high tide, would get hung up on these beach obstacles. But they figured that the Allies would want to attack at high tide because that would mean they had less beach to cover until they could get off the beach into an area where they had a better chance of getting off. Here are other defenses. You can see those right here. There's Rommel marching through it. And he knew that this long beach, the longer the men are on there, German guns could rape the beach. There's no defenses. They had to get to the hills and off the beach to any kind of protection. So his plan was to lay this. In fact, here are a couple of these. Um, these are allied bits. That's Omaha Beach, huddling behind German defenses that are put on the beach. You can see a few there, and the tide is just starting to come in. And you can get an idea of the hell of Omaha Beach. And this is a pretty good picture I found of the different types of beaches, beach defenses. And so the cliffs and hills had, um, these are called pillboxes and bunkers all above, and then machine gun nests, trenches, all along this beach. And then they put these, not as many of them, they're called the steel Belgian gates. The, the, the Belgians invented those before uh, 1940. And then they called these teller mines. And these are mines that are angled towards the sea that would catch landing craft, and then ramps that would catch landing craft, and then finally hedgehogs, the last obstacles that would catch on the beach. With the idea being any landing craft would get caught up on these, and then the men would have to get out there and potentially drown. And then this area of barbed wire, minefields, he would lay, he wanted to lay over four million mines and would lay pretty close to that. Well, when the Allies saw these beach defenses, they, have, they decide they're going to have to attack at low tide because they could not afford to lose any landing craft here. But the problem with that is they have to advance all this way to the seawall, and men caught on the beach are going to be slaughtered. One more thing, the beach defenses were so off, a lot of the landing craft would end up dropping their ramps and letting the men out 100 feet even from the shoreline at low tide. And so they had to go through the water with 100-pound packs. A lot of them drowned. It was, especially on Omaha Beach. And so the defenses had some effect. And that's actually on one of the 
That's on Jersey Island, but there's one like this at, at uh, Calais. Those are one of the big observation um, posts, and you see all the decks with the observation posts to to um, to guide all the German artillery along the coastline. That is at Omaha, and that's a few of the beach defenses that are still existing, but kind of blown up, and they're blown up by the Allies and, and pulled out to make room for roads to get off the beach, and they're just still there. But one more thing I have to add. Here's the Long Caratan Beach, and I'm about done. But the Long Caratan Beach, and these are the code names for the beaches, and I'll go over these in just again one second. These are the British and Canadians, all one beach, and then there's a really high cliff, so they can't land there, and then another beach, nicknamed Omaha, and then more cliffs and this high point du Hawk, which um, from this spot can see both Omaha and Omaha and Utah Beach. By the way, those guns I showed you are right here, right along there, the rage on both coasts, and then Utah. Now, the Germans looked at that and decided, okay, if the Allies are going to attack, they're going to try to attack along this, along that whole beach. Hmm, I wonder if I can... that better? Uh, actually, I kind of like that, but... I didn't mean to make a pin mark, but I did. Oh, well, that pin mark goes away. <laughs> I'm having fun with this. I know you're having fun watching this. So I'll make it a little bigger right here, but this, right, they knew that the Allies would want as wide a beach as possible to get as many men on shore as possible. So when they're trying to defend from here to here, knowing with a limited amount of very good soldiers, what they did is they put their best experienced soldiers, many of them with experience from the Russian front, right in the middle, which just happened to be Omaha Beach. And that's the place they want to hold, knowing that even if the Allies are able to take the other beaches here and here, they'll have two separate beachheads, they won't be able to get, be able to get as many supplies in, and each beach would be easier then for the Germans to push back to the sea. So that was their plan. And so here... They put relatively weak forces, and this wasn't all that defended except for a few key areas, and they did kind of the same thing here. They put weak forces, in fact, a lot of them were Russian prisoners that were induced in many ways to volunteer to join the German army with the idea being, well, you can, um, you want to fight the Soviets. And to be honest, they were ready to surrender, and almost all of them did when the war began. The problem with that is those guys would immediately be sent to Stalin. You can only guess what Stalin did to them. And these were relatively weak forces here compared to Omaha. Now, in Juneau, since they knew this was the middle of a, this stretch of beach, they did defend that the hardest. And so the three under the British Second Army, the one taken by the Canadians, Juneau would be the hardest beach. So that was their plan. And then behind the beaches, they looked at it and they knew because of what the Allies did in Sicily and then at the invasion of Italy at a place called Salerno. They landed parachutists to cover the flanks. And so here, a little bit here, but a lot here, they flooded all this area. There were marshlands, uh, they were heavily irrigated, they flooded it, opened up all the, the, um, all the dikes for the irrigation ditches, and flooded miles of that. I guess I gotta go back to automatic. And 
this is actually behind Utah Beach. And so those are all flooded, um, all these causeways flooded, knowing that a parachute is land there, I think you can see what the problem is. Not only parachutes will land in this flooded area and potentially drown, but any gliders that are carrying their supplies, if they try to land on these flat fields, they would be destroyed or drowned. So these are all the Allied commanders. I'm gonna go for a few more minutes and I'll finish. I see there's one message and it was retracted. But uh, these are, that's Bradley. Um, Beetle Smith was Eisenhower's chief of staff. Leigh Mowry was the head of the RAF, the Royal Air Force, and therefore command of the, of the Allied Air Forces. Montgomery, the land operation. Uh, Ramsey, Admiral Ramsey, the Royal Navy, was the actual invasion itself. And so that's, those are the, the command, the brain trust, that's a publicity figure. You'll notice the, the map behind them shows nothing. And there they are again. But there's Southampton, these are the docks, getting ready for the invasion, getting ready for the supplies. These are landing craft tanks, they're called, and these are uh, Canadian, almost certainly. And there's Churchill visiting all the forces of Southampton. These are locomotives that are being ready to go to France when they have to move supplies very quickly. And this would be the main invasion route. There's the British and Canadian armies right there, and there's their three beaches, and there's the US forces right here. Now, there's one operation that's kind of hidden. It's called Operation Tiger, and ex or Exercise Tiger. And Exercise Tiger was a practice landing. They had not done these landing invasions that often. And Tiger was gonna be, so Southampton's here, Tiger was gonna be right there, just gonna practice invasion. And the idea was there would be uh, some live, the opposing forces would use some live ammunition to give a real idea of the attack. This was all done in secret. So this was an entirely secret operation involving a couple US regiments, so about 10,000 US soldiers. Well. Germans anticipated this and they sent their torpedo boats. And that's a picture right there called E-boats. And this was a month before the invasion. And they caught these landing craft, vulnerable landing craft, as they were preparing to go to begin to exercise Tiger. And they sunk a number of ships and killed or wounded over a thousand American soldiers. And this was kept secret from the American public. Exercise Tiger was one of the one of the biggest tragedies of the war, and people did, in the United States did not know about it till long after the war. They're, they heard about their loved ones who were killed in this as just operations of fighting in Europe and didn't even know why. Right there. And so we're gonna get right to here, the last thing for today, and then I'll have to finish this tomorrow. This always takes a little bit longer. I hope we were able to get through some. Uh, I know some people there's a, a few people watching. I hope uh, you're getting something out of this. But these are the code name for the beaches. So from west to east, the code name for this beach right here, the easternmost beach, that will be Utah Beach. And there are a number of infantry divisions there, but the only one, the 4th Infantry Division. I should add the 90th, which would be reinforcements. My grandpa was in the 90th. He landed the evening as reinforcements on Utah. So the 4th Infantry Division. They had some experience in Sicily, but most of them were relatively raw. Rangers would attack Point du Hoc and scale the very high cliffs right here. But Omaha Beach would be the first U.S. Infantry Division with support from the 29th. And the first Infantry Division is, well, the first U.S. Infantry Division created in the 20th century in World War I. It's the oldest U.S. Infantry Division. It had the most experience. It fought in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. And that's why they fought there. Of course, a lot of these guys have gone through all of that. And that was very hard on them. And then this gap. And then Gold Beach, 50th British. And then the very difficult Juno Beach that the third Canadians would take. And then Sword Beach. And Sword Beach would be the third infantry division. But Wiesterham right here would be French command. And the longest day they show the French commandos. So the fourth, the first, the 50th, the third, and the third. And, and then two U.S. Airborne Divisions. The 101st, 
and the 82nd Airborne. And then the British 6th Airborne Division would land right here. So those are the beaches. And that just gives you some numbers. It was the largest amphibious invasion in world history up to that time. Okinawa is coming the next year. So that's where I'll quit. I will come out, we'll try another chat, but maybe we'll do a chat with just the chat room and just have everybody respond. That was a little bit uh, hard to follow. And we know there's a, like a half second delay. And so I'll talk about this again tomorrow, but I have the movie called The Longest Day. It's a great movie, but it's three hours. And I don't know how we can do a movie night. I don't know how we work it out unless we just all just kind of chat uh, by typing, if you want to watch it, but it is a fantastic movie, and it, used, it literally was on Netflix and Amazon Prime to just a few, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago, and then, and then of course they took it off, and so you can rent it on Amazon, but somebody whose name will remain nameless has found a version that they put on their website. A link to it and it goes through Google Drive it's it's we'll say it's our little secret but it's a pretty good copy and it's on there so it's on Google Drive so we'll get back to that but that's we'll stop a few more things about the invasion and I will do I'll see about Battlefield Europe and if there's no questions I hope this helped I will put this up as an assignment for everybody to watch um, a lot of stuff to cover I hope I didn't go too fast and I'm going to stop streaming. I want all of you to have a good rest of the day. I'm going to try to do it again about the same time tomorrow. So 